Welcome back in class with Dr. Greg Carr. In class with Carr, it is uh, Saturday once again. Let me thank you, Dr. Carr, for joining us. Subscribe, follow him at Africana Carr. All right. Last week, we, we did the Aunt Jemima piece. Yes. In the Aunt Jemima piece, you mentioned something about Disney. I can't remember now. Yes. How you brought that in, but you take us on these journeys, and I'm like, okay, we're going to have to come back to Disney, because what people don't know about you is that in addition to you being this great scholar, you are, and I think this is scholarship as well, you're into comic books. Oh, you're, no question. You, know, you, you, have, you have a broad spectrum of likes, and, uh, and you know some <laughs> things about just about everything. So, nah. so tell uh, us about how racist uh, Walt Disney was. <laughs> <Racist> <laughs> Walt Disney. Well, you know, it's funny, Ken, you say that because, um, you know, we talk about uh, cartoons. My father, bless the uh, bless the dead ancestors, Haywood Carr. When I was a kid, I was eight years old when I discovered Black Panther. In fact, I tell the story. My man Todd Stephen Burroughs. This is the best book on Black Panther, Marvel's Black Panther by Todd Stephen Burroughs. He's actually in Jersey, uh, born and raised Newark, Brick City. He uh, teaches at uh, uh, Seton Hall University. Very good brother, Todd Burroughs. I wrote the afterword to this, Marvel's Black Panther, a comic book biography from Stan Lee to Ta-Nehisi Coates. And I know we're not talking about Black Panther today, but just in the context of comics and, and, and cartoons, so to speak. My father, now tell the story, I was eight years old when I discovered uh, T'Challa and Black Panther. Uh, I went around the corner to the little black drugstore, Mr. Neely's drugstore in South Nashville, and bought an Archie comic book. Now, you know, this is a whole thing. We could all talk about Betty and Veronica and all the images that seared in little black boys heads and children, right? You know what I'm saying? So I get home with the comic book. My father's like, what, well, why you spend money on a funny book? Cause you know, my daddy, man, 25 cent a lot of money, <laughs> you know? So we talk, it's like 1973. So, and you know, I said, oh yeah, I don't really want this. So I went back and I went back to switch out the comic books. I didn't know you couldn't do that, Mr. Neely. It's like, what you talking about? You want to switch comic books? I said, yeah, I don't want this. And so he let me switch. And I got a copy of, uh, I guess it was Defenders. I didn't even know. I got in the middle of the Defenders Avengers War. They was in a, a multi, but the, the thing that caught my eye was on a couple of pages in that issue was T'Challa, the Black Panther. They got black comic book heroes. And so that sent me looking for everything. People don't know if you watch the movies like Marvel movies, if you didn't know, you wouldn't know that in the comic books, Captain America, I want to say it's 173. It was a couple of years later. Captain America and the Falcon go to Wakanda and it's T'Challa, the Black Panther, that designs the Falcon's wings. Because he's really a sidekick with Captain America. T'Challa's like, hey man, come in here uh, for a minute. And then in the next page, you look, and he comes out with these wings that do all this stuff. And Captain America's like, oh, wow. He's like, yeah, you, oh yeah, these brothers is hooking each other up. So Luke Cage, hero for hire, uh, Storm, when the X-Men, all that stuff is part of the coming of age of a generation of black folks. So when we saw these movies come out, we like, don't mess up so-and-so. Don't. I heard Janelle, Janelle Monet, for example, is lobbying to play Storm. I said, I could see that, but I could see India Ire probably better. Anyway, but anyway, my point is that in the world of my father, comic books and funny books were the same thing. <laughs> so yeah, they call them funny books. Like I said, so if, if Black Panther was no different than comic strips in the newspapers. And comic strips are sequential art. Well, the first people to do sequential art in world history, of course, are black people. Why? Every summer we go to Egypt, you see sequential art. It's called hieroglyphs. <laughs> you see people, you follow the story down the wall and it's got writing and hieroglyphs and it's got pictures that are also writing and you follow the life of Tahotep and here he is fishing, here he is at his house, here he is at work and you, and you read if you can read the glyphs, you can see his life. That's sequential art. That's all comics are, is sequential art. Well, what is a cartoon? A cartoon is the sequential art in moving images now. Now you're going to broadcast the moving image. So all cartoons are is a medium. Just like comic strips, just like comic books with panels and word bubbles, all that stuff is sequential art telling a story. So the question we then ask ourselves is not necessarily when, when the comic book's invented, when is sequential art invented, when are, um, uh, when are cartoons invented, but what is the purpose of these things? 
Mm. And that's where it gets interesting when it comes to what we were talking about in very briefly with Aunt Jemima. And the book that we mentioned that uh, I saw is dropped in for a book you must get is this book. Because, you know, I, I told you, man, you know, we were talking about, we were talking about Mickey Mouse being a minstrel right. and Disney being a racist. And so the critique of Walt Disney being a racist is probably less interesting if, if only for the fact that Walt Disney wasn't American. So it kind of kind of comes with being a white American. If you want to get to a to an American broadcast group, after all, this man allowed Song of the South to be broadcast, even though Disney won't let you see it now. It was so racist. But uh, um, allegedly, according to a couple of his biographers, I think Neil Gabler is one of them who wrote uh, Walt Disney biography. Uh, you know, the argument is that he tried to tone some of that stuff down. He even tried to meet with the NAACP to talk about it. And there's a whole rack of scholarship on how the NAACP was out there saying, you know, this stuff is racist because it doesn't represent black people. It doesn't oh, represent. Our, and it, exactly. And of course, the NAACP tried to come for Amos and Andy. And so what you also see is the class tensions in the black community. Because you got Negroes watching that stuff saying, man, y'all bourgeois Negroes be quiet. That stuff is funny. Kingfish, the sapphire. Like, oh, oh what are we going to do? So, so Disney. I mean, pause for a second because my daddy um, loved that. So I'm going to just. Loved Amos and Andy? Amos and Andy, Pigmeek Markham. He's from Newark, you know. And, you know, there's this duality, you know, where. And this is the thing that I think as black people, I, I struggle most with because we have an inward facing, we, we, we make fun of one another, we play the dozens, we do the, we've talked about this before, we, we ridicule one another, it's destructive, it's also taught to us, right? But there's yeah, yeah. a glee and a joy in watching, oh, here comes a judge, and uh, you know, what you say about it, and all that sapphire and all of that? Yes. There's, there's something that we, we gain pleasure out of, the, yes. the ridicule of us at the exact same time, publicly we don't want y'all to you know what i'm saying like and we see it yeah, in our I music do. in our rap music in our i mean if we modern day cardi b all of them no disrespect yeah. Nicki no. We, you know those are modern day minstrels yeah oh i just said it out loud i said it that's all right well, i'm about to give you some backup in a minute okay. <laughs> oh dynamic duel so, so i'm gonna shut up go ahead talk no 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 please don't shut up you know why as you're talking i'm I'm listening and I'm feeling every word. You are pouring that right into my soul because your father wasn't alone. I would get Amos and Andy tapes in South Nashville at a comic book and record store called The Great Escape. We would ride our bikes down there and buy them cassette tapes because we didn't grow up in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. We didn't know as preteens and teenagers with a little bit of money from cutting grass after we bought our comic books, we go get them tapes as well, among other things. We did not know that on the radio, all of those actors were white. Right, right. We, right. <laughs> we thought they were black. Right. Yeah. Right. Wow. And, 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 I, and I connected to Amos and Andy specifically because my father, who was born in the 1920s, who was drafted into World War II with his four, uh, with Four of his brothers, five of them drafted. So all that saving private Ryan's, no, nah, I don't even try. No, nah, they was wiping out black families. All them boys came out of East Tennessee. All of them except the baby brother Charles because he was too young. So let's be clear. But the music, the soundtrack of my father's youth was the big bands, was Basie and them. And he used to keep that stuff on the radio. And so Amos and Andy, Bibber McGee and Molly, uh, George Burns and Evie Gracie, all that stuff was of a piece of that period. And so there are generations of Black people who absolutely loved Amos and Andy because that was the Black show on radio, which was the biggest thing all is. So you listen, you tuned in to Amos and Andy. So no, the reason I was reacting is because I absolutely get that. I get it. I, I, I think we talked about this before too. It's, you know, off mic, we talked about this off mic, so I'm gonna bring it on mic. Yes. You know, we'll tune into something with a black face, even if it's mediocre, even if it doesn't live up to what it, even if that person sitting in that seat may not really be for us, we're gonna <laughs> support it because there's no, because it's, it's us, That's you know? Right. 
And so at some point, though, there needs to be a raising of the bar and a standard and a litmus test about are you good for us or not? Yeah. And we shouldn't just lean in just because. But that's when you don't see anything. Nat King Cole, Julia, I grew up. First time I saw a black woman was Diane Carroll on TV, Lil Corey. Um, you know, you, you lean in and thank God she had a lot of dignity in the yes. way that she, you know, but the black exploitation era with Gordon Parks and, and Melvin Van Peoples and Cotton Come to Harlem and all that, you know, Shaft and, you know, it, it glorified certain things that, you know, gave the world an idea that black people like drugs and prostitution and all, you know, sugar and, the, you know, and all the fight and the violence and stuff, which really wasn't who we are. No. But we, we supported it, so therefore it, it actually defined us. Which is but the, it did, it ooh. did. And, 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 and we think about the, the context of some people, some academics refer to it as the public sphere. We could just say things that are visible. And now, of course, young people will call it platform. If we know everybody's going to see it, what then is the cultural logic of representation because you're absolutely right. When Avis and Andy went off radio and came on television, that they hired a rack of black actors because they couldn't get away with blackface on live television. And guess what? Black people watch. Hey, somebody black on TV. And we both just old enough to remember when somebody black came on TV and the phone call went around. Oh, so-and-so is on so-and-so. And we got to see. When Nat Cole debuted his variety show, Nat Cole, my God. Nat Cole out of Alabama. Nat Cole who had perfect pitch. Nat Cole who didn't even sing. Nat King Cole was the piano player in the Nat Cole trio and started singing. They said, oh shit, you can sing? And now nobody even remembers Nat Cole was a brilliant jazz pianist. But they found he had perfect pitch. Nat Cole, who yes, he had a comp, but I promise you, Nat Cole to this day, if they ever have a competition for coolest black man in American popular culture, Nat Cole is going to be on the finalist list. Because <laughs> he was, I mean, Nat Cole could sing a perfect ballad with a cigarette in his finger. And then <laughs> look at that camera. But Nat Cole's variety show, head and shoulders above anybody else, Perry Como, Frank Snow, you name it. But Nat Cole's show couldn't stay on the air, in part because you couldn't generate the type of sponsors to keep the revenue in, to keep clearly the most talented entertainer. And that's no disrespect to any rest of them. I listen to that skinny kid from Hoboken. I like Frank Sinatra, but let's be very clear. Nat Cole, that's Nat Cole. <laughs> you understand? They, there's a reason they call him King. Oh, shout out, by the way, to his brother, Freddie, who just passed away a couple of weeks ago. Freddie Cole, another jazz uh, singer. Beautiful. So just made transition in 2020, if you can believe that. But you but, don't but know, sir. No, no, no. I'm just saying no. But 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 yeah, but no, but 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 it's important, Karen, what you're raising is very important because when you only get one, and this was Cole's thing. Look, if it's only gonna be one of us, I'm about to put some on y'all. Y'all ain't never seen. So when you see Nat Cole in that short run series standing next to Harry Belafonte and they singing that duet, this is very deliberate. Nat Cole is like, if I'm gonna get a shot at this. Y'all going to see us. It's like the modern jazz quartet thing when the beboppers were doing all their thing and the MJQ, John Lewis and them, they was like, look, when we come out here to play, we're going to have suits on. We're going to be straight because y'all think all, everybody who is in jazz is a drug addict. And guess what? We got friends and family who struggle with addiction. But when y'all see us, y'all going to say, damn, them cats look good. And then we hit this thing like, yeah, jazz does not mean everybody's strung out on drugs. And we loved Charlie Parker. We love Miles Davis. So don't get us wrong, but we only get one shot. So yes, if you see us on television at that time, that's an achievement. And remember, the 50s is also the decade, not only Amos and Andy, not only Nat Cole, they got Beulah. So guess what? We're going to make a little live action uh, Aunt Jemima on here because we're going to sneak our little thing in, right? But they also have Hazel. Meaning what? We're going to have a white working class made. I mean, in other words, they're going to give you what they think will sell. And of course, the rule of thumb typically in television has been nostalgia, what Gil Scott Heron said. They wanna go back, even if it's only last week. So in the 50s, they making shows about the 30s and 40s. In the 60s and 70s, they making shows about the 50s, Happy Days, Laverne and Shirley. They get to the 80s, they're gonna go back a little bit. Julia, absolutely, a paradigm shaker. And of course, what you have Diane Carroll, is following a little bit in the wake of, actually, she isn't following in the wake of anyone, really, because she's that Nat Cole as a woman. I'm going to show y'all this thing. And at the same time, 
she is overlapping with a person who plays a walk-on role, but who is extremely important because of how she carries herself. And that's Nichelle Nichols, who of course plays Lieutenant Uhura on Star Trek. Martin King said, when he met her, he said, you know, Coretta and I allow the children to stay up when Star Trek comes on because we want them to see you. And she, he, he's back. Uh, she writes about this in her, and I got it right here somewhere, her, her autobiography, uh, Beyond Uhura. That's the name of her autobiography. Nichelle Nichols is like, you know, Dr. King told me that I was doing a lot for the civil rights movement, just being who I was in space. <laughs> and of course, we know Uhura is a riff on Uhuru, which is Kiswahili for freedom. So Lieutenant Uhura is like, I mean, so, so it's important. Representation is very important, which is why Walt Disney and what the Disney company did, and Disney is not an outlier, they're not alone, was perpetuate stereotypes about black life that if you weren't paying attention, you might think weren't about black people, but they were absolutely about black people, which is why when we were talking about Aunt Jemima uh, last week and we were talking in the context of these images of black people, Roustus, for example, who is the father of Uncle Ben in some of those ways, cream of wheat, these kind of cream of wheat rather, uh, the idea of this mammy figure who becomes the, the, the parent in some ways of Aunt Jemima, the attempt to stereotype. We talked about this book, Nicholas Salmon, Birth of an Industry, Blackface Minstrelsy and the Rise of American Animation. The reason we were talking about this book, of course, is because people will find it hard to believe that some of their most beloved cartoon characters are not based on blackface minstrelsy. In fact, let me read what Professor Hammond writes, who's uh, he's at the University of Toronto. He's in Canada. Let me read what he says on, I think it's page five in here, if you remember. Oh, yeah. Look, watch this. He says, um... Commercial animation in the United States did not borrow from blackface minstrelsy, nor was it simply influenced by it. Rather, American animation is actually, in many of its most enduring incarnations, an integral part of the ongoing iconographic and performative traditions of blackface. Now, here's the bomb. Mickey Mouse isn't like a minstrel. He is a minstrel. Betty Boop's sidekicks, Bimbo and Coco, aren't references to minstrelsy. They too are minstrelsies. He nails Felix the Cat. He got Daffy Duck. He got, in other words, these are not like minstrels. These are black people. Yes. Minnie and Mickey got on white gloves. They got their white, in fact, oh my God, he opens the book. I love how he opens the book. And you've probably seen this one before. We had to search around him for it now because they tried to scrub the place. 1933, Disney did a, 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 um, um, a cartoon called Mickey's Melodrama. Instead of melodrama, he spells melodrama, M-E-L-L-E-R-D-R-A-M-M-E-R, -L -L -E like Ebonics, melodrama. In that cartoon, 1933, the Disney characters are all getting dressed in their costumes to perform Uncle Tom's Cabin. So you see Minnie putting on black face, but she already got on black face. She got white gloves and black face on, little black ears. And then Mickey, oh, I remember this too. Mickey does, well, he says, um, Minnie as little Eva takes great pleasure in powdering her face and dyeing a blonde wig. Clarabelle blacks up with the aid of chimney soot from an old lamp. Mickey, who will play both Topsy and Uncle Tom, inserts a firecracker into his mouth and lights the fuse. He literally blasts himself into blackness. So these are the early Disney cartoons, but people say, well, that's all old stuff. They got rid of that. No, they didn't. Do you still see Mickey? Yeah. He's still, still face still black, got them white gloves on? Yeah. All right. But here's the other thing. And this is just very quickly, because again, we just doing a few breadcrumbs, right? So people, I would, I would encourage people to read this book. Let's look at the sequence. Because what Salmon also writes about is that what happens is the genre may change, but the techniques and the routines, they move from one form to the other. So minstrelsy really has its origins around the 1840s and 50s, then really civil rights, uh, civil war era, and then after. The first person we see, and there's a rack of books written about this, uh, William Lehman has some good ones called Jump, one called Jump Jim Crow. William Lehman has one on that. Uh, it's a book called Blacking Up that talks about this. Some of the things we talked about in the Angel Mama conversation. But 
the first person to achieve like a national profile for doing this blackface minstrelsy stuff is Thomas Rice, Thomas D. Rice. They called him Daddy Rice. Uh, he was known for performing Jim Crow. And of course, the whole lie at the beginning of minstrelsy was that, well, we're not really making these dances and songs up. We saw Black people doing these songs and dances, and so we're copying them. That's why Eric Loft in his book, Lot, in his book, Love and Theft, talk about minstrelsy. The idea is we're performing Blackness. Now, this is 2020. Hmm, do we have any experience with non-Black people saying, I'm just paying respect to the culture? I'm just, I'm not, I'm not Black, but I'm doing what I see Black people do because I think it's so fascinating. Okay, I mean, this is one reason why, I mean, I know there are a lot of people out there and some of my students will at me and fight me about Marshall Mathers. I've never been a fan of Eminem. Why? I don't care. I mean, I don't, I'm not against him. I'm not for him either. Because as a self-respecting person of African descent, if I want to hear Black music, I'll listen to Black music. I mean, I don't need to hear, and understanding that when I hear Marshall Mathers, when I hear his hip hop, I also hear his experiences. Some of the most deranged, twisted, these fantasies of murder, killing your mama, all these rape fantasies. Oh, yeah, that's you. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, that's Eminem. If y'all into that, go ahead. Because, and in fact, I remember when he did record the thing with uh, where they put him on the track with Biggie and 50 and them, the realist N-words, right? And I'm listening for him to drop the N-word, which he didn't. Okay, Dre done trained you. Because I know there's some things you better not do. But anyway, that's, that's neither here nor there. But the whole idea of appropriation well, goes back to the... Oh, some would say, I have an answer for this. Well, uh, Charlie uh, Price and, uh, you know, who do you, what about the black people that do rock and roll? And <laughs> hey, keep, keep going. Keep, keep, keep going, Karen, because oh, as I told you, well, Professor I, Clark, I'm going to say this because I got to go get this book. Go oh, tell me, what's the argument? Yeah, uh, so yeah, well, you guys are appropriating, you know, uh, country music and rock and roll. That's our culture. That's our, why, you know, why, why is that okay? As we wait for the car to come back. Come on. No, I'm here. Come on. I was listening the whole time. Here's the thing. You know, I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. The num the uh country music in the United States, we ain't we that's another thing. We had to talk about that another day, right? Charlie Pride, all them cats, right? That stuff, people look at um, what is it? They look at Nashville as like the capital of country music. And I saw you was in there giving it out on social media on Twitter, Karen, talking about uh, Lady Antebellum trying to jack this sister, Lady A. Come on. These white kids went to Nashville and then they took this promotional picture dressed up in antebellum, in other words, pre-Civil War clothes in front of a Civil War era slave, oh, well, mansion, which means plantation mansion. And they say, well, Antebellum will be a good name. Yeah, but see, I'm from Nashville. I know what it's like when the uh, cover band comes up to play Leonard Skinner Freebird and everybody starts screaming. Why? Yeah. With uh, what's his name? Ronnie Van Zant and all them and their Confederate flags that Skinner used for years. And hey, they got great music recorded in Muscle Shoals, Alabama. Muscle Shoals is also where Bob Marley played. In fact, when you listen to some Marley's first album and the Wailers, some of the same musicians who playing with Skinner and them playing with Bob Marley. So this ain't about musical, uh, uh, musical talent. This is about cultural imagery. So when you say Lady Antebellum, you didn't make no accident. You part that neo-Southern white nationalist move that is in the heart of country music. But I'm saying I have to say that um, the idea of Nashville as the place you go to get famous in country music goes back. Nashville had a radio station, WSM Radio. WSM Radio stands for, it stood for, We Serve Millions, because an insurance company, Life and Casualty Insurance Company, Life Insurance, Life and Casualty Insurance Building, still in Nashville, it was like the sponsor for the WSM. On the clear channel that they used to broadcast before their program would come on, they would play European classical opera, European classical music. And then they would put the country music show on. They called the country music show because it followed the opera. The legend says WSM, the announcer came on and said, well, you just heard uh, the grand old opera. Now we're gonna play the grand old Opry. And that's where the grand old Opry came from following the European opera, they played the country music. When the grand old Opry show would come on WSM, you would hear uh, a harmonica 
I'm looking for my harmonica. You, you can hear a harmonica. A harmonica. I'm, I'm from Nashville, so you know, I mean, it's called Mount Park, there it is. <laughs> so you would hear a harmonica. I ain't gonna start playing this on my, cause I ain't that good yet. I'm just saying, but you, a little song. No, I can't play no, you got me. I'm gonna knock my camera off, this little puck, this little puck harmonica, right? So the, 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 the harmonica you would hear would sound just like a train. Because the train imagery in country music is huge, right? Wabash, Cannonball, the uh, Roy Acuff, all them cats, man, coming to eat. It's the train. Rawr, rawr, keep going. Right? Of course, we know one of the roots of country music is the blues. We know the word banjo comes from West Africa. There's a brand, there's a book came out a couple years ago called The Banjo, an African instrument. So we know that all that stuff gets imported. There's a whole book I got around here somewhere on Appalachian banjo players and country music. But the little guy playing that, uh, that harmonica, this is the answer to all them people to talk about. What about Charlie Pride? What about black people in country music? The little guy playing that harmonica at WSM for the Grand Ole Opry to introduce what became the platform that launched country music as a billion dollar industry in this country. His name was D. Ford Bailey. <laughs> a black star in early country music. There he is right there. So anybody want to talk about black people in country music? If they don't know the name D4 Bailey, just tell them to check out your channel. David Morton wrote it with Charles K. Wolf, University of Tennessee Press. My man, D4 Bailey. D4 Bailey was the black first black star in the WSM, the Grand Ole Opry. He was at the beginning. And then he said, that, let me, let me, uh, chapter two of here, this is his, they interviewed him, right? Chapter two is, which also bothers me because again, could have been with your publishing company and he would have made his own book. You know what I'm saying? But now what happens is people wait for black people to get famous or infamous and then they go write books about them. It's 1991. He says, they didn't give me no Rattler. They gave me a harp. Chapter 10, the black and the white all wanted to hear the same tune. In other words, they didn't know listening to the radio, it was the black dude. Country music is black music. It's a car crash between the chorus of West Africa, the rhythms of West Africa, the Scotch Iris up in them Appalachian Hills, the clock, it's a car crash. It's an American car crash, but guess what gives it the foundation to play it is the rhythm and the blues of Africa. And finally, just like Charlie Parker used to say, Nat Hentoff writes about this in some of his books. He talks about Charlie Parker, the great jazz musician out of Kansas City who learned to play the blues very young, going into uh, places and on a juke joint in juke joints or in uh, little restaurants and stuff and going to the uh, jukebox and playing country music. And one day, one of the, some of the guys was like, man, Bird, why are you always playing that country music? He said, it's the stories, man. Listen to the stories. Country music is the blues. I done lost my woman. I ain't got no money. I'm walking over the flu. That didn't come from Ireland. That's not troubadours out of England. That's the blues. These white boys is listening to the blues. So. When we talk, we have a birthright to country music. Jimi Hendrix. Hendrix played music in Nashville before he ended up in Seattle wearing that purple that inspired Prince. All that stuff traces out of our thrust. But, so the minstrelsy, as I was saying, in terms of appropriation, right? The minstrelsy is based on not honest stuff, like those country music folk who are hanging with D. Ford Bailey, and I'm gonna hold out for a minute somebody who I think is probably closer to the honest people than not, except the fame and the celebrity was too much of a pull and he couldn't resist. And that's Elvis Aaron Presley, right out of Tupelo, Mississippi. I mean, he came by it honest. You can't say Elvis, you know, Elvis is not pretending. Big Mama Thornton and all of them. Exactly, Big Mama Thornton, oh yeah. Big Mama Thornton should have been paid. Elvis's problem is you don't hit them off with the stuff, but, you know, and I'm not giving him an excuse. I mean, I'm like public enemy. He's a hero the most, but he don't mean S to me. So, but, but he did come by it honest. It's not like he didn't grow up listening to that music. That having been said, minstrelsy comes when you are deliberately ripping off blackness as you are caricature and making characters of it at the same time. And you're reinforcing stereotypes, which is why you go from minstrelsy, Jim Crow and them, through Reconstruction era, then you get to burlesque. Burlesque, all the stereotypes. Loose women, 
people prat falling, falling on each other, seltzer bottles, all this comedy stuff. This too is a form of minstrelsy. Vaudeville, the same way, broad humor, physical humor, prat falls. Where's all this falling down and slapping people and stuff coming from? It's coming from the abuse of black people. Salmon walks through the whole thing. In other words, you don't have anybody black on the stage, but the performances are of how you imagine blackness to be in reality. Give you a quick example, because you go from minstrelsy to burlesque, burlesque to vaudeville, and there's overlap between these. Because the other thing is, performers in one genre end up in the next genre, so there's overlap. From vaudeville, now you get movies. Who emerges in this burlesque, vaudeville, broad, physical humor, slapping, making funny noises, almost infantile in their comedy, but are huge stars in the early movies. Three Stooges and the, and the Marx Brothers. Exactly. That's minstrelsy. All that stuff. These are iterations of performances of blackness. In other words, you don't have to have black people, but of course, you don't not have to have blackface in it because see, minstrelsy is the genre. Blackface minstrelsy is a subset. In other words, you can black yourself up sometime, Ben Crosby, Mickey Rooney. In other words, you can blackface yourself up sometime, but you don't have to blackface yourself up to do those performances of that style. And then of course, movies, radio, television to this day. So here we are in 2020, and you know you can always see the minstrel. Now you don't have to put on blackface. You just gotta be, uh, if you're a black male, maybe you run around with a very high pitched voice and you're always running into stuff and then you hit a wall or you say something crazy, somebody slap you in the face, fill in the blank of your favorite entertainer. Understand that those types go all the way back and the thread that comes through them finally with the cartoons, Mickey Mouse, Felix the Cat, all these cats, they're literally in black, but Daffy Duck, Daff, come on, Daffy Duck. And the crazy thing is the kids now will say, oh, Daffy Duck is a brother. Say again. Heckle and Jekyll. Heckle and Jekyll, no question. Look, Felix, Mickey, Bugs, Daffy. Now let's stop on Bugs Bunny for a minute because this is very, this is fascinating. Bugs Bunny is a different story, a little bit. Because remember, Joel Chandler Harris writes those Uncle Remus stories. We talked about that a little bit with, uh, with Aunt Jemima. In the 19th century, you know, while Stephen Foster is writing them Camp Town Ladies, singing this song, do-da, do-da, and all that music finds its way into Warner Brothers cartoons as well. Foghorn Leghorn, that nice white nationalist. Well, a boy, I tell you, son, I, uh, well, uh, yeah, you are, you, you, you're the clan adjacent chicken who's walking around in the South. <laughs> you know, Belvedere and all that stuff. You cats is coming, y'all really don't hide this, do you? But, the point is that Bugs Bunny is interesting because when you look at the so-called trickster traditions of West Africa, um, um, a Nancy really isn't a trickster figure. Eshu in Yoruba or Elegba or Elegbara, depending on who where he's called. This is the this is the little monkey that gets on the boat, meaning comes over with the Africans who have those traditions and ends up in Cuba and Santeria, ends up in Vodun, ends up in Cadomble in Brazil, ends up, uh, and then when he gets to North America in among the enslaved there, this is the figure, uh, let, me, let me explain it very quickly, I can do it 30 seconds, in Ifa, in one of the, the, the philosophical traditions of West Africa, mostly associated with the Yoruba people. In Ifa, Eshu is the little monkey who shows up at the beginning of creation, and when God is giving out all the powers, uh, God says, I'm going to bring all the animals and the animal who it wins the competition for being the most beautiful or the strongest is going to get the power of the Ashe. And that's when we say Ashe in libation. Ashe is the power to make things happen, the power to literally make things animate. Mm -hmm. So all the animals come in with their stuff and the elephants say, I can do this, the gorillas. Here come the little monkey. The monkey comes with a red feather on his head. And all the monkeys, all the animals are like, oh, shit's nice, man. God is like, I'm giving you the Ashe. Because out of everything everybody did, you were the only one that stopped everybody when you came here with that fly feather on your head. So Eshu ends up with the Ashe. That means you have the power to make life thing, like life. You've got the power to guide force, really. Eshu's job 
Sometimes you see him as a monkey. Sometimes you see him as a little uh, clay, uh, kind of upside down, it's like a half coconut. They put little calories in him. You, you, sometimes you know, you know, you you're on the East Coast, so you go in some people's house. They may have a little eshu sitting in the corner or since so You gotta always look for a little eshu. So y'all know, y'all see a little two-eyed carrot with a little mouth on a half shell. Yeah, you in somebody's house that know something. As Malcolm in the Nation of Islam said, "Those that know don't say; those that say don't know." So at any rate, eshu sits at the crossroads. That means that at moments in your life, eshu's job is to make sure you don't stay at that crossroad. You gotta make a decision. So Eshu, in many stories, is the irritant. So you send it, look, all right, should I take this job? Should I quit my job? Should I move? Eshu is there like, you better do something because you can't stay here. I'm gonna irritate you. I'm gonna, and you, can, you can try to shoot Eshu. You can try to stomp Eshu. Eshu got the Ashe. You can't kill Eshu. Eshu can't be harmed. But you got to get off this crossroad. Which way you going? That monkey is still a monkey in some traditions in West Africa. It's still a monkey in some traditions in the diaspora as these Africans come and mingle with other people in New Orleans and Havana and Port-au-Prince, Port-au-Spain, Trinidad. But that monkey morphs into other animals that they have available to them where they end up going. Airplanes ain't got monkeys. You know what their monkey turns into in a lot of places? The rabbit. The rabbit begins taking the properties of Eshu and in some places loses the name Eshu altogether. So for example, mm. the rabbit becomes Brother Rabbit Brer or Brer Rabbit. Rabbit. And if you think about Joel Chandler Harris and claiming he heard these stories from black people and he gonna get rich writing them down, Brer Rabbit, the tar baby, Brer Rabbit, the briar patch, how is the Eshu energy there? Brer Rabbit is like, please don't throw me in the briar patch. Please don't throw me in the briar patch. <laughs> you throw me in the briar patch, I'm gonna die. So what do they do? They throw him in the briar patch. Once they get over there, thanks. In other words, he's irritating you and you made the wrong choice. The tar baby, they got the tar baby. You, you, you say, kiss the tar baby. Oh, now your lips are stuck. Now you put your hand on it. Now your hand is stuck. Now you try to get off the other hand. Now your other. See, you made the wrong choice. Eshu is the trickster. He's the trickster and what he's going to reveal by making you choose, he's going to make you reveal your character. Got nothing to do with him. When Br'er Rabbit stories get to the cartoons, one of brother turns them into Bugs Bunny. Now I'm telling you, they didn't know that they were inheriting all that African spirituality and intellectual systems, but think about the Bugs Bunny cartoon. He can't even be killed. Every time Elmer Fudd tried to kill him, he blow his own face off. And Bugs Bunny just keep Munching the carrot and walk away. <laughs> duck season, rabbit season, duck season, rabbit season, rabbit season, duck season, boom! What the hell? I'm making you choose. Daffy, this your character. Elmer, this your character. I'm good. You can't kill me. So I'm saying Bugs Bunny is in a different kind of category if for no other reason than some echo of that African root found its way into his character in Warner Brothers so that, yeah, he's going to irritate the hell out of everybody and he's going to be all right. So you meant to stick with him. But the other stuff, the minstrelsy, that's there. And so that's when we started with Aunt Jemima. It's interesting that we had to talk about this. But I would recommend, because it really just makes you mad. Sure. I, I, yeah, I should, I, probably, I should probably say one other thing. Do we need to be mad right now, Dr. Carr? I mean. Well, James Baldwin was like, you know, what was it? Baldwin that said to be black in America is to be in a constant state of rage. Yes. <laughs> but, but see, but we're not mad this afternoon because you and me, when we're talking like this, that's part of it, though. When you know you can choose different. And even just knowing eases that anger because it eases up off of us the ambiguity of not knowing. And then we can make a different set of decisions. I mean, I think about even now, we talked about the monuments the other day and we were talking about everything that's going on. And uh, it's interesting because, you know, I went back, I was, I was digging for my other books the carving of Mount Rushmore. I didn't have this one before. I knew I had Rex Smith book around here somewhere. He talking about how that dude, that those those quarters that they sold for Mount Rushmore, even I mean uh, for Stone Mountain, even though he got fired from Stone Mountain, he caught he he did the design for the quarters that we were talking about that Baruch had that he gave up to raise money. But at any rate, when you think about the uh, the question of how our stereotypes influence us, the more we know, the better we can choose. So they're taking down monuments. We're saying this monument, that monument. Then Disney says you know what, we're gonna elevate the princess and the frog. Okay, black visibility. 
Black Princess. The story is ostensibly anchored somewhere in New Orleans, Vodun. You got some things like that. That's nice, different theme. What about this princess business, though? That's the question. The paradigm coming out of Western Eurasia, Northwest Europe, if you want to call it, the idea of gender and power has at the center this idea of female powerlessness. So the job of a princess is to find a prince. So you can make the prince, you can make the princess brown, you can make the princess black, but if you haven't changed the fundamental template, the order of how we think about society, then all you've done is create kind of a brown face minstrelsy of whiteness. You haven't changed, which is why I say Hamilton is Ooh. just a difficult thing to stomach because the t David Daweed and Leslie Odom Jr. and, and Lin Manuel Miranda, brilliant, funny artists, and it pulls you in to reinforce the idea of founding fathers. I mean, if I want to watch that, I'd just rather watch uh, 1776. I'll go back and look at the movie they made back in the 70s around the bicentennial and watch white men play white men rather than watch black men play white men wow. because to me, that's just a shade above a reverse minstrelsy. And at some point, I would love to have that because you just hit me. The notion of a woman finding a king or a prince is not African. No, no, it's not. At all. Nope, nope. In fact, among the Akan, the queen mothers picked the Asantahini. That's so right. when you look in among the Akan, it's like, it, but see, we know that. If you see a man out front in leadership formation in many African societies, including in the diaspora, the black church, for example, you best believe that some women somewhere in this decision-making tree said, yeah, he can go. He can go out front. But the West doesn't have that. They've never respected women. Zeus taking Hera from behind. You go all the way back and all the way forward. There's no concept. I challenge you. The Listen. Queen of England. Which one? This, this one that won't die. And oh, I'm yes. That's very true. <laughs> this one. You know what? That, you're true. That is true. But you, know what the, are... you know what it is about her? She's a Taurus. All right. <laughs> That's why you can't, she, she won't die. He ain't dying and she ain't giving up that, that throne either. Like, we're gonna, gonna, we gonna, we gonna live a long time. I ain't mad at her then. She is because she done beat Elizabeth. No, it is Elizabeth, isn't it? it is I'm Elizabeth. talking about Victoria. Victoria. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, she beating Victoria. Yeah. So you know what? That is interesting, isn't it? That is interesting. That well she's an anomaly. I've been watching the crown. I don't know why I got Oh, I'm glad. Those those period pieces are the bomb. How is it? Interesting because there's that piece with Nkrumah. There's that piece where you know, where they're going through Africa and I was, you know, watching it through the lens of what I know now having gone there, you know, and it's, it's fascinating when you know more, which is why this scholarship, this, this, these breadcrumbs that we drop every week, if people are actually picking them up and then taking them to the next place, you can look at everything like you just said about this Mitchell thing, the music we listen to, the TV shows that we like, why do we like them? What right. is it that is satiating in our, in our appetite that has been developed, but that is not natural to us? Is this natural to who we are as people fundamentally at our core? And then you can look at things, not just blindly, not being reinforced with somebody else's, his story, but now that's you're right. like, oh, yeah, I see that. No, that's right. That's yeah. right. So and what you've, done, what you've done by having us have this space is slot in. It's so interesting that it's Saturday. Because in fact, I was just looking at, uh, I don't know if I have it over here. I was looking, my man, James Anderson at University of Illinois, he wrote a book called, I don't know if I have it. Oh yeah, I do. The Education of Blacks in the South. I love this book. This is one of my favorite books. The Education of Blacks in the South. I love James Anderson. This is a very important brother. Uh, and he talks about the fact that after the Civil War, and actually Carter Woodson wrote a book called The uh, Education the okay. Education of the Negro, prior to the uh, Civil War. In the first chapter, he talks about the fact that Black people, really before the Civil War, but then after the Civil War got really started, they would have what they call Sabbath schools. So Sunday schools. And we know the origin of Sunday school in our community wasn't just about worship. That's how these kids would learn how to read. That's how these children, they would get their children to, exactly, exactly. I and so- I feel it too much, sack the car, I'm trying- Weekend to school, oh, you're right, you're trying, yes, right. <laughs> I'm trying. That's all right, people can, 
People can read for themselves. But, but, but the reason I love it is because Anderson talks about this. When the white missionaries came south during the Civil War and they came to black people and said, look, we're going to help y'all start these schools. Black people were like, look, we'll take your money, but we don't want your teachers. <laughs> In other words, we'll, we'll, we'll handle this. We never mistook resources for our agenda, which is why I think we get caught up with integration. No, our objective was get these resources. If I'm sitting next to you, that means they can't cheat me out of the same money they're paying to educate you. But what we also got then were jacked up textbooks, misrepresentations, and you're absolutely right. There's nothing natural about our cultural tastes. Culture is not something we're born with in some ways. Culture is something that we are trained into. So if we're trained into things, as you say, if it is unnatural in the sense that this goes against, you know, uh, uh, some kind of innate feeling I have, something doesn't feel good about this. Many of the problems we have in these societies, these are human made problems, which means they can be solved by humans. But if you keep going to the one template, then of course you're gonna come up with intersectionality. Why? Well, who disaggregated race as a concept, gender as a concept, class as a concept, when no human being on the planet lives as a raced person, a gendered person, or a classed person. Oh, those are your categories. You created these artificial categories, and now we got to talk about intersections. How about we get rid of those categories? <laughs> oh, we can't do that. Yes, we can. Why? Because you just gave them to us yesterday, and then every time I wanted to say something, you told me to be quiet, and then you took my children and didn't tell them anything that their grandparents told them, and then you put these categories in their minds. So when the thing doesn't feel good, they think the only way to get out of it is to take your categories, and there's the trick. You can't free yourself through those categories. Audrey Lord said that. You can't use their tools to dismantle that house. <laughs> you need to so. Man, I love you. So before we go, yes, your shirt is Egyptian. I know that from the- Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, you give them homework. Now I'm just saying, let me see if I can, you can see it. Yeah, there we go. So explain this. Onk. Is this a, what is this? What is oh, my onks my, I mean, this is, finger. this is the, uh, the kind of cup with the handle. I'll come up real close. Let me see if I can get real close. So you can see right, yep. the cup with the handle yep. is I'll, I'll take a pen. Cut with the handle is K. The flowering reed symbol is I. This is an owl. The owl symbol is m. This is kind of like the, uh, well, the Egyptian vulture, which is the ah sound. T is the uh, loaf, upside down loaf. And then kh, this is like the, uh, the enclosure with, this, with the uh, loop. Kh, and then the double reed is e. Yeah, I see the double reed. So yes, it's e. So it's like, Kimati, Kim Kimati. That's my Kikuyu name. I got that name. Oh my God! Twenty-five years ago, it's Kikuyu. Didan Kimati was a leader of the Kenyan Land Freedom Army, in uh, what what the Europeans called the Mau Mau. So you, so when the British when the British were fighting the people in Kenya, and uh, they told them, you know, are you in the Mau Mau? All the black women working in the houses. Mau Mau, what's that? I don't know about the Mau Mau. Then that night, they'd be at the Mau Mau meet. So in other words, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, I got that name from a, actually a Yoruba priestess, Wacy Nelson, who, who named me at a, at a ritual ceremony. And so, yeah, when I go to Kemet, I usually get a couple of these because, you know, they're good for teaching children. A child can learn hieroglyphs. It's not, it's not, it's not hard at all. I love it. I love it. Let me just thank you again. I got uh, a lot of homework to do. I don't think, is there enough time? You know, I think we need at least, the reason why I think life is short is because we waste time. Mm. Right? And and I think oh. both of us are going to be here a long time because we got a lot of things to read and a lot of things to teach. Yes, we do. And I'm sitting here like, I need another 100, maybe another 150 years to get through all of this Come scholarship on. and then be able to disseminate it and then put it back out like a mama bird. I know know that's right. Yeah, that's how I feel about it. But you are uh, amazing, an amazing teacher, master. You're the treasure. Thank you for this because people are watching and you made this space and I can't thank you enough, Karen. This is a, this is a new lease on life. We, we're going to get, we're going to get free. We're going to get free. <laughs> it's, it's a given. And let it's me say, follow him at Africana Car, C-A-R-A-R-A, -A -R -A, Africana Car <laughs> on the Twitters and subscribe to this channel. Subscribe. Right. And then, then share it, share it, because you know, this Please. is a gift.
that keeps on giving. I love Please. you. I thank love you. you. All right, y'all. Uh, next Saturday. Yes, ma'am. Sunday school.